Don't you, it doesn't it drive you nuts when you have something that is relatively simple to understand and yet it seems very complicated. And, uh, and, and I think we kind of live in a universe that is that way. I mean, the universe is very complex, but there are some simple, very simple truths that we find in it. For, for instance, we know that the universe is expanding. And so we know it started from one point and it continually expands. We've learned that from the Hubble telescope years ago. We also know that the universe is running down because the second law of thermodynamics states that usable energy is running out. And if you don't believe that, you just got to look in the mirror and, and you will notice that you are slowly running out, right? And that's uh, the gray hairs that you get. It's, it's your body parts working not as well as they used to. It's the wrinkles on your skin and, and you're slowly running down. And even the radiation of our sun, we can tell that the universe is winding down. It's slowly losing its energy and things are beginning to fade away. And the radiation of our sun is produced by, by its losing part of its mass. And so when you go outside and you feel the warmth of the sun, maybe not this time of year, but in the summertime, you feel the warmth of the sun on your face and on your body. It's because the sun is burning its own mass and losing its mass. In fact, 4.2 million tons a second, the sun is burning up. And so eventually the sun will burn itself out and it is, it is winding down. It's running down and if this is the case which it is the universe had a beginning the universe will also have an end and it's the same with us and this is what Peter is trying to get at at this final final moments this final dialogue that he writes down in 2nd Peter chapter 3 now Peter he's at the end of his life we know that when he writes Second Peter, he's in his 70s. We don't know exactly how old he is. He knows he's going to die. He knows he has like a bounty on his head from, from Emperor Nero, and he's going to be crucified very shortly. And uh, these, are, these are, might be the, the final words ever recorded by this man as he lives on planet earth. Peter knows he's going to die, and so he, he reveals this in the, in, in, uh, earlier on when he said uh, this in chapter 1, the Lord has shown me that I must put off this tent. And so his tent, that's something when I do a funeral, I refer to the body as a tent, or I, I refer to taking off yourself and, 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 and being done with it. And the tent is never meant to last forever. The tent is something that eventually breaks down and wears out. And what he does in this final part is he takes us not only to, to understanding our own mortality in this, but he's also wanting us to understand the end of the age and how things will play out in the final days. And so he wants to take the reader to the end of the age. Everything you see around you, it's going to be gone. It's not going to be here any longer. Because of that, he says we ought to be living a certain way. We ought to be thinking a certain way. And I'm sure you've heard Christians in the past say it's all going to burn anyways when something breaks down or they get a flat tire or something doesn't go as planned. And, and you just refer to kind of the material things like, oh, it's just going to burn anyways. And, and that statement is actually true. It is all going to burn. And, and, and we should, it should compel us to live a certain way. And Peter explains what it should do. And so in this final, final things that Peter wants us to remember this week, we're going to tackle three things he wants us to remember, three final thoughts to remember as we close out Second Peter this week. The first one is this. Remember that everything is temporary. Remember that everything is temporary. And so last Friday, I go to uh, the grocery store and I had to pick up a few things at the grocery store. Last Friday, there was like gale force winds, okay? And uh, I'm sitting there, I have my young, youngest son with me and I'm driving the van. I park the van in the parking lot of the grocery store. I open up the car door and the winds took it. It pulled the door right out of my hands and the door hit the car next to me. 
And I was like, oh no, you feel so bad when, when it hits the car next to you. And I look over and uh, it is a like very nice, uh, brand new, kind of expensive car. And uh, what I thought would maybe be like a ding is actually a mark like this big in the side of it. And it's dented the car beside me. And I'm like, oh goodness, this is... This is awful. This is not how I wanted to start my day. It's my day off. I, I didn't want to have to, to deal with this, and I just feel it's crummy about myself. Anyways, I'm at the grocery store, and so the person doesn't come out for a long time, and I'm getting my insurance out, and I'm waiting, and I'm, I'm wondering how this is all going to play out, and, and uh, I wait there for about 40 minutes before someone comes. After they're done their groceries, they come back to their car, and they're beginning to, to load their car up with their groceries, and I came up to them, and I said, I'm so sorry. Uh, I, it was a total accident, but when I opened the door of my, my van, it hit your car, and I did, it did quite a bit of damage. And this person, this woman was like, oh, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And I was like, no, it's, it's pretty bad. You should look at this. It's pretty bad. And so I showed her, and she's like, oh, wow, that is, that is pretty bad. And we exchanged kind of uh, information and insurance and whatever, and uh, she said to me, don't worry, cars won't last forever. You know, don't, don't worry, it's not a big deal, it's just a car. And, and I think that's, that's an interesting point of view. This woman was so gracious to me in that time, but she was kind of living out this understanding that, you know, it's just a car. It, it, it's temporary. It's not the most important of things. And this is what Peter wants us to, to remember here in 2 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 10. And so let's check this out. He says this, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. That's what we covered last week, right? That's how we kind of ended last week with that. And, uh, but if we continue down to verse 12, he says this, That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. And so what Peter is doing is he's expanding on what he already explained last week, okay? And so let me just refresh your memory. So last week we looked at uh, verses 5 to 7 of chapter 3. And, and, and remember these, remember this, this kind of concept here. He said this, But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word the heavens came into being, the earth was formed out of water and by water, by these waters also the world uh, of that time was deluged and destroyed. The same word... The present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And so what we get from this is that in the past, God made the earth from water, okay? It was made from water. And when people turned from him, he used the same thing that he created the world with. He used it to destroy the world, right? With water, and he promised he's never going to do that again. And we have the, the symbol of the rainbow as a promise for that. And now we see everything here. We see now it's being destroyed by fire. It's not water anymore, right? Because there's, there's fire all around us. We, we realize this, right? Our universe, the stars, they're fiery masses. And I remember that just a few days ago, I was talking with my oldest son, and he was asking, you know, what, what is the sun made of? How, how, does, how does it, and we were kind of talking a little bit about that, and we have a sun, and the surface temperature of that sun is 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? The surface of the sun. And, and at the core, that sun is burning at 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. It, it's hot, all right? And it's burning itself up. It is a fiery mass. That's very, very hot. But it, what, it, it's what gives us a warm feeling on a nice sunny day, even though we're 93 million miles away from it, okay? And not only is the universe filled with these blazing balls of fire, we live on an earth that at its core is molten rock. And, and it is it is hot. In fact, it, it is burning at the core of the earth that we now sit. It is burning at 12,400 degrees Fahrenheit. And the only thing that separates us from the core of our earth is 15 kilometers of crust that is, that, that's kind of on the outside that we would understand as our ground and, and the mass that we stand on, right? The entire creation, the, 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 the entire universe is, is, is almost, in a sense, like at the atomic level, like, a, like an atomic bomb. <laughs> and the Bible says that eventually it's all going to go down. And, and it's going to go down by fire. It's going to go down by fire. 
And, and it's not like Peter, he, he, it's not like he's just dreaming this up and he's over at Mucho Burrito and he puts the, the fire sauce or whatever on his burrito as he's writing this in 2 Peter. And he's like, yeah, that's hot. I think it's going to write down. It's going to go down by fire. And he writes that down. He's, he's, not, he's not doing it like that. It's not just popping into his head. He's actually, he's actually telling us what the Bible has already talked about. In fact, we see it mentioned several times before his stance on this and what he tells us in verses like this in Isaiah 66, 15 and 16. In the Old Testament, it says this, See, the Lord is coming with fire, and his chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and with his sword, the Lord will execute judgment on all people, and many will be those slain by the Lord. Or in Micah. You can see this in chapter 1, verse 4. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire. Or in Malachi 4, verse 1, it reads, Surely the day is coming. It'll burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will, will, uh, will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. And so the, the Bible repeatedly says this. It says it time and time again, all through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament. And, and it says the world is going to end, but now we see how it's going to end. It's going to end by fire. Je Jesus even said this. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And in Revelation 21, John the Apostle, he sees a revelation. He sees a new heaven and he sees a new earth. And, and, and here's the thing. Here, here's the thing with 2 Peter that we, that, we, that we need to understand is that this is in the Bible. And I know for some of us, it's difficult to digest some of this. And some of it is by interpretation. And we, we don't know exactly every detail about how this is all going to play out and how it's going to end. But these are important things that John wants us to wrestle with. And that's what's been really enlightening about this series, right, is, is, is learning these things, wrestling with it, and understanding what we believe and how we understand this. But we shouldn't avoid it. We, we got to talk this stuff through and figure it out. See, I want to give you a, just, just, just an understanding of maybe, maybe how this will play out at the end of days. Just, just a little bit here as we, as we understand this and as we talked about the day of the Lord last week, all right? By the time you get to chapter 21, in the book of Revelation. Remember last week I said that we'll, we'll have an understanding. John lays out this from chapter 6 to 19. But as we get to chapter 21 in Revelation, the day of the Lord has already passed. All right? It's already taken place. Jesus coming back from heaven to earth is a past event. That has already happened. Most scholars believe, I mean, roughly a thousand year reign, but we don't, we don't exactly know, but, but that would kind of be their interpretation of, of, of what's going on there. That Jesus reigns for a thousand years, and then after that, the present earth will be destroyed, okay? So all that kind of stuff has happened, and then the present earth will be destroyed, and a new one will be put in its place, and this is what we understand is the end of humanity. We know how, we just don't know when. We know that things are going to happen in the end of days and eventually the earth will be destroyed by fire, but we don't know when that is happening. Which leads us to point number two here that, uh, that, that Peter would have us remember. Re remember as a final thing. Remember your relationship with Jesus is timeless. Right? It, it, it goes, it goes it's, I mean, it, it's happening right now, but it will go on in the future. In fact, you can check this out in chapter 3, verse 13. It says this, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. We're looking forward to that, right? It's a promise that is, is being mentioned off of Isaiah 66, right? As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord. See, Jesus, Jesus even says, I'm going, to, I'm, going to head, I'm going to head to prepare a place for you. And he, he's preparing a, a new heaven and a new earth. He's, he's going before us. Now, what's interesting here is that the word for this, the, the word for new is a different word that is used in the, the, in the rest of the Bible here. This is the same word new that, that is used in, 
in, uh, right here that is used in Revelation 21. It's the same word. See, a word that is typically used here in, uh, in, this, in this chapter, in this understanding, is the Greek word neos. That, that would be the typical word that is used, which, which really means it's associated with time or chronological order and the newness of that. But the word that is used here and in chapter 21 of Revelation is the word kainos, and it means a, a new or different sort, a new in quality, something that is new that's never been seen before. It's not building on anything else. It's just absolutely absolutely brand new, from nothing to something, okay? And so I think this is important for us to read Revelation chapter 21. We'll, we'll go from verses 1 to 5, just so we can understand this a little better in what he's talking about in this timeless relationship with Jesus. He says this, this is John, right? This is John's revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of, from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. See, God created out of nothing, and he will destroy what he created. He will recreate after it's done. He will recreate. And there's something troubling that I noticed about this. If we can go back to the, the first part of, of 1 verse 5, what I find interesting about this is, is this. There's, a, there, there's no longer any sea. When I saw that, I was like, what are you talking about? There's no water? There's no, there's no ocean? There's no sea? This new world? And, 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 and this, a lot of scholars would interpret this in, in many different ways. This could be referring to, um, you know, sea is used all throughout the Bible uh, to, 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 uh, in parallel with understanding other nations who are opposed to God and raging sea. And I mean, we, we don't know exactly what this means, but that kind of stood out to me as I was looking at this. The other thing that stood out to me is, uh, is a new city, a holy city, um, the New Jerusalem. Now, now this, I don't think there's any holy cities, all right? There's, there's, I, I've never gone to an actual holy city, let alone a holy neighborhood or a holy house, all right? I don't think there's anything that we really find in our world that is, that is set apart as holy in our world. But this is interesting, right? The New Jerusalem, this city coming down out of heaven from God. This is, this is fascinating to me because I, I don't totally comprehend it. The city that is actually like coming down, I don't know if it's physically doing that, but it's coming down out of heaven. I don't know if it's like orbiting the earth or this new earth. I, I have no idea, but we get some descriptions on the size of this if you continue to read in the book of Revelation. And this new holy city of Jerusalem, it is recorded to be about two 1,414 kilometers cubed, all right? That, that's roughly from Ottawa to Miami and Washington to Denver, okay? Cubed, okay? That, that's a pretty massive area, and this is the new city, a capital city of the new earth, the new heaven, the new earth, its capital city, Jerusalem, and, and this city, if you, if you just took those dimensions, there's been calculations that, that it would be able to ho house about 20 billion people in it. And each of those 20 billion people, if we were breaking down the size of that city, a, a, a cubed, each, each person in that citizen in that city would have about five acres cubed to live in. So quite a bit of room. And all of that would only take up 25% of the city. You'd have 75% still available for, for parks. I mean, if, that, if that's the physical way we were going to look at it, and I don't know how this all plays out, but it's, it's a fascinating thing to, to remember that Jesus is preparing something we have no comprehension of, we have no understanding of. We go what the book of Revelation says, and we're, we're trying to grapple with that, but this amazing new place, this perfect place, with no crying, no tears, no pain, no hurt. And that's exciting to me, right? It's exciting to me to think about my relationship with Jesus is timeless, which leads us to the final point here. Remember that our compass is true. 
Remember that our compass is true. Now, now Tuesday, I'm, I'm heading out to, uh, I've been taking a couple classes and I'm going on site to take one of these classes to study a church in San Diego, okay? And so I go there and, uh, and I, know, I know the name of the hotel I'm staying at and I know the name of the church I need to go to, but I, I don't really know how to get there. I'm just bringing my phone with me and my phone has m- the Maps app and I'm just going to go from that. It's going to take me from, from, from where I land to where I need to go and I'm not going to really look into it. I'm just going to type in the address and it's going to take me there because I'm, I'm going to trust it, right? And it's amazing the day in which we live is we just trust these devices to take us places that we wouldn't ever know how to get to were it not for the app or were it not for the, the smartphone. And, and Peter's kind of, kind of referencing something similar here. There, there's something that we have that is a compass to how we walk and how we do our lives that can take us from point A to point B. And we need to trust in what it says. And it really gives us some assurance of a few things. See, if we go back to 2 Peter, in verse 13, it said, according to his promise, according to his promise, the new heaven and the new earth. And he's referring to promises that are made in the Bible. And one of the things that we, that we see Peter always do is he always points back. He always points back to, this isn't anything new. I'm not speaking anything new for you guys. All I'm doing is I'm telling you what the Old Testament, the prophet said in the Old Testament. I'm telling you what Jesus said. And now we're just telling you the same thing that's already been said. Like It's, it's not new what we're telling you, okay? And he's saying it's boiling down to, 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 to using this as a compass. These final things that I'm letting you know, you got to remember that this is your compass to go forward in the future. And there's a few things that, that a compass really does for us. And one of the things is that it motivates, it motivates our will. In fact, if you look at verse 11, check this out. It says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? See, if you knew that everything is materialistic, which, which you should if you knew everything was materialistic, it was going to be destroyed, what kind of person should you be? Should you be the person that is living for the vacation, the, the, the car, the, the house, the new clothes, the, the restaurant? Should you be a person that is living for those things or should you be a person that has hope for tomorrow in the things that are to come? That's what Peter's getting at here. It's, it's look long term. See, the second thing that it does is it, is it really settles our hearts. Settles our hearts. In verse 14, it says this. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. See, I, I find this a little, a little contradictory as I read this um, because he just got through telling us that everything is going to be, to be burned up and, uh, and, 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 to, and be destroyed. And he says, like, look forward to this. And, and that, that, that's really difficult for me. And, and why should we look forward to this? Well, why should we look ahead and look forward to this? Because he's saying that this isn't the end of the story, right? It's, the, the world burning up and the tribulation and, and all the judgment of God, it's not, it's not the end of the story. And whatever you're going through is not the end of the story. Because at one time and in one day, Jesus will come back again and he's prepared a new heaven and a new earth for us. The story's not over. And so at the beginning of, uh, of, of the teaching today, we, we kind of read a passage from the first chapter of 2 Peter where Peter just says that he, he's going to be uh, leaving his tent behind soon, that he's been living in this tent, but, but it's almost done. He's referring to his body, right? And when I do a funeral, I often will mention the very same thing and talking about, about leaving our tent behind and, and it's temporary thing. It's not meant to last forever. Now, when I was a kid, I heard this story and I thought it'd be fitting as we close here today. And so listen carefully and see how this relates to what we just learned and looking forward to the future. It says this, it's the person who is living in the tent. It was nice living in this tent when it was strong and secure and the sun was shining and the air was warm, but Mr. Tentmaker, it, it's, it's scary now. You see, my tent is acting like it's not going to hold together. The poles seem weak and they shift with the wind. A couple of stakes have wiggled loose from the sand and worst of all, the canvas has a rip. It no longer protects me from the beating rain or the, or the mosquitoes and the flies. It's scary here, Mr. Tentmaker. Well, why did you give me such a flimsy tent? 
I can see by looking around the campground that some of the tents, they're much stronger, they're much more suitable and stable than mine. Why, Mr. Tentmaker, did you pick a tent of such poor quality for me? And even more important, what do you intend to do about it? Now, this is the tent maker or God speaking. O oh, little tent dweller, as the creator and the provider of tents, I know all about you and your tent. I love you both. I made a tent for myself once and lived in it on your campground. My, my tent was vulnerable too, and some vicious attackers ripped it to pieces while I was still in it. It was a terrible experience, but you'll be glad to know they couldn't hurt me. Oh, little tent dweller, I'm now prepared to come and to live in your tent with you, if you'll invite me. You'll learn as we dwell together that real security comes from my being in your tent with you. When the storms come, you can huddle in my arms and I'll hold you. Someday, little tent dweller, someday your tent is going to collapse. You see, I've designed it only for temporary use. But when it does, you and I are going to leave together. I promise not to leave before you do. And then, free of all that would hinder or restrict, we will move to our permanent home. And together, forever, we will be happy and glad. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for the tents that you give us. And uh, we know that they're temporary and they're, they're not going to live uh, forever and uh, not going to last forever. And, and, and we know this. We know this deep down inside that nothing does. And yet, Father, we want, to, we want to press forward in what you call us to do. We want to look forward to what you've prepared for us, God. We want to, to, to use your word as a compass in our life as we look forward to the day of being reunited with you. And so, Father, we just pray for peace as we grapple with scriptures like we read, God, that we could, we could understand that, that you are a God of love and mercy and that you are waiting for more people to come to you to ask if you would dwell in their tent. And so, Father, give us strength and hope as we press on to the goal laid out for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And so if you're watching today, uh, we want to invite you to a, to a few next steps. So, so some practical things that we can learn from the teaching here today and moving forward and growing deeper in our understanding and our relationship with God. The, the first one would be this. A tent is never meant to last forever. But, but we know a soul is, right? So how are you preparing your soul for eternity? I mean, I mean we prepare our bodies for all kinds of things, our tents. We, 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 we spend money on our tents, we spend time on our tents, we, we put our resources and efforts into our tent. But what are you doing for your soul? If it's the one that's actually going to last forever, what are you doing to prepare your soul? Second, if you knew the world was going to end tomorrow, how would you act today? So in light of tomorrow and believing what's going to happen tomorrow, what Peter talks about in, in his book, how should that cause us to live today? And so we challenge you to take these, to live them out, and to press forward in the truth that God has for you.